Hi, everybody. This is the lecture for week 14, all about animals and fungi. I'm going to transition to my PowerPoint here. Just one lecture this week, our last lecture on the diversification of life. So just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, so on Moodle, you should be able to see um, your feedback, first of all, for your first presentation. Overall, you guys did a really great job. The videos were excellent. Thanks for um, your hard work in making this transition. Um, so part one looked pretty good. You have very specific feedback from me on suggestions for improvement um, or things you guys did really well. And because I'm getting that feedback to you a little later than I hoped, the next presentation, instead of having been due this coming Sunday, uh, will be due Wednesday, April 22nd. And that's posted in Moodle as well, so it's not um, too hard to keep track. So next Wednesday is when the final phylogeny presentation will be due. Um, and again, please check Moodle, the, the places where you did or would have uploaded your slides and your video. Please look there for your feedback from me on your first presentation. Um, so with that said, no more lab activities for the rest of the semester. We've got this week, week 14, and next week, week 15. Those are the last weeks of instruction. And then week 16 would have been finals week. You'll have more details from me on what our final will look like. So again, stay tuned next week for that. In the meantime, don't worry about it. Just focus on um, finishing up these last couple lectures. Okay, so those are the announcements I have. Again, let me know if you have any questions or concerns as we're moving towards the end of this semester. All right, so now we can get into our agenda. So first we'll talk about fungi, and then we'll talk about animals. So here are the goals I have for this lecture. So number one, be able to define the evolutionary relationships between fungi and animals. Um, so are they closely related? Are they far apart? Just being able to define that relationship. Explain the ecological contributions and unique attributes of fungi and animals. So this lecture will be set up pretty similarly to the first couple, right? So we'll talk about ecological contributions, medical importance, those things. Also be able to describe the various ecological categories of animals. We'll spend some time thinking about how we can um, separate animals into groups. So these aren't evolutionary categories. These are based on their ecology or how they're interacting with others in their environment. And then that fourth bullet point, just like the other lectures we've seen, I really hope that uh, this um, lecture, this information will help you begin to appreciate the diversity of fungi and animals. This is just a very, very small snapshot, a very small sliver of the diversity that's out there. So I hope this kind of sparks curiosity and that you continue to learn more about these groups. But for now, we're going to dig into um, what we have planned for today. So here are a few pictures that just give you a snapshot. Um, we're going from the microscopic, like in this picture on the top left, to the macroscopic, like this ring tail gleamer right here in the middle. Okay, so thinking back um, to the big tree of life, we had those three groups, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. So eukaryotes are those things with a nucleus. And that's what separates eukaryotes from archaea and bacteria. Within eukaryotes, we have kind of four major groups. So protists, again, were that paraphyletic, group because it includes most or all eukaryotes that aren't plants, fungi, and animals. So not one tight-knit thing, um, but a paraphyletic group. We talked about plants um, in the previous lecture, and now we'll discuss fungi and animals. So first, fungi. So I studied these a little bit for my uh, graduate work. Um, I'm working with Dr. Zettler on the fungi that work with orchids. We'll talk about plants and fungi in a minute. Um, suffice to say, this is another group near and dear to my heart. So this group we will span from the microscopic to the large, the macroscopic. So right here, this picture with these orange spheres are yeasts. So you can thank them for the bread that we eat. 
Um, but if we leave that bread out a little too long, another kind of fungus or a mold can colonize it and grow on it and feed off of it. Um, I've definitely had this in my house before. Um, and if we go on a bigger scale, if you've seen morel mushrooms, these are a really popular item that people will forage for in the spring and fall. So if you're able to get outside and explore um, to negate the kind of stir craziness of being inside all the time, right after it rains is a really good time to seed mushrooms growing up out of the ground. In any case. Okay, so moving on with fungi. So this is the tree from your book. If you look at the scientific papers that have come out since we're constantly revising um, the relationships between fungi. This is kind of a hard group because um, just like protists, there's no one character that we can use to define fungi as a whole. It's kind of fuzzy toward the base of the tree. And if you notice, there are a few red branches right here. And so these are categorized as zygomycetes. So according to this tree, it's not one certain group. With chytrids as well, we kind of have them spaced out in the tree a little bit. So if you notice in any of your um, literature that you were looking at, if it looked more like this, if it looked kind of like a comb, instead of having um, two, like one speciation event that led to two, here we have multiple lineages coming out of one branch. That's called a polytomy or a comb. And that just means we don't know yet what those relationships are. Again, trees are hypotheses. So more information might change these ideas. In any case, we have these kind of different main groups. You can see some of the traits that set them apart. And overall, as a whole, fungi, so all of the individuals that we can put in this tree, the things that are it's most closely related to, fungi as a whole, are most closely related to animals. So there's a couple characteristics that, that unite this. Um, for example, we both plants, or, excuse me, animals and fungi um, eat other things, so we can't photosynthesize. So that's, that's, that's apart from plants. And when we look at the DNA evidence, our genes, the letters in our, our genetic code, there are overall more similarities between animals and fungi. So for that first goal, remember, be able to define that fungi and animals are the most closely related. So plants are equally related to a group including animals and fungi. Okay, so along that line, metabolism and feeding behavior, these are the things that unite animals and fungi. So all fungi are heterotrophed. Hetero meaning different, troph uh, meaning food or eating. Um, so plants are autotrophs, auto because they can make their own food. Heterotrophs need to go out and find it. So humans, animals, and fungi are heterotrophs. Um, fungi are chemical masters because in order to eat their food, they need to be able to absorb it through their cells. And so they need uh, these digestive enzymes that can break their food down. So that mold growing on your bread is secreting enzymes that break down the bread into smaller pieces so it can absorb it into itself. And so most fungi, um, one category we call filamentous because they're made of these little filaments called hyphae. This is kind of the main body part of a fungus is the hyphae, just these little threads um, these filaments. They're made of individual cells that you can see in this um, blown up diagram right here. So each one of those gray circles is a nucleus. Um, so hyphae is what fungi look like most of the time. Uh, when they're ready to reproduce, they make a mushroom if they're part of that mushroom forming group. And so that's what this structure is right here. Um, and that's just basically inflated hyphae. Pretty cool. In any case, so the way they, they're able to break down food, their hyphae are able to grow into, be it a tree bark or a piece of bread or whatever substrate it's growing on, secretes those digestive enzymes. So in our stomachs, we have like stomach acid that help break things down. Fungi do this on the outside of their cells. 
they break down nutrients either in the soil, again, or, or whatever food they're eating, and then the cells are able to absorb that nutrition. Okay. So because they're so good at breaking things down, um, this is one of the biggest things they contribute to their environment. So fungi as a whole are really good decomposers. So that means they're good at recycling nutrients in the environment. If you've been on a hike or if you've seen a tree um, that's not doing so well, that dead wood is lots of food available for a fungus. So these fungi are able to grow in and break down those really um, tough cell walls that plants have um, and digest it for food. So in a, in a forest environment, fungi are able to break down um, dead trees and then make those nutrients available for other things. So really good decomposers. Um, not many other organisms are able to break down woody plants. So termites are an exception and that's because they have um, cool things that live in their gut that help them break those down. Okay, so one thing they can contribute, they're good decomposers and recyclers of nutrients. Another thing is they, they have really cool relationships with plants. So in the Plants and Protus lecture, we talked about plants making that transition on the land. Well, that wouldn't have happened, a lot of scientists think, unless fungi were able to help them out. So almost from the time that plants have come onto land, they've had these really intimate connections with fungi. And we call those symbiotic relationships. So on the whole, sometimes it's a, it's a give and take or a mutualism. Sometimes there are fungi that can grow in the roots of these plants that take more energy than they give. So that's less nice. Um, so we have this whole range between mutually beneficial relationships and um, things that can be more one-sided. But all of those relationships fall under this umbrella of symbiotic or living really closely together. So most land plants have some kind of symbiotic fungus in their roots. And what are they doing there? Well, if we look at this figure right here, all of these really tiny web-like things are those fungal hyphae, those fungal cells that are growing into the soil. Um, so fungi can grow inside of the root or around the outside of the root, um, but also dig into the soil. The fungi can go a little bit farther than the plant roots can so they can bring the plant water or other nutrients that the plant might not have been able to reach in the soil. Um, they're also trans, uh, transferring nutrients. So plants grow a lot taller than fungi. They photosynthesize and they make those sugars. They can transport those sugars all the way down to their roots and give those fungi some sugar that the fungi otherwise wouldn't have been able to get access to. And in exchange, sometimes those fungi then can give them nutrients that it was able to reach that the plant couldn't get to. So a lot of mycorrhizal relationships have this kind of nutrient exchange. Um, other things that scientists are finding out is that these mycorrhizal fungi can help um, send signals to different plants. They can also help um, defend the plant from pests and diseases. So there's, there's all kinds of really amazing functions that these fungi have. Um, down here in this image, we can see, you can do this experiment a lot of different ways, uh, but you can show that if you grow a plant like this marigold in a pot without any kind of beneficial fungus, it will grow pretty well and it will flower a little bit. Um, but if you use the exact same conditions, exact same soil, water, sunlight, all that stuff, but you add a beneficial fungus, this is what that same plant would grow up to look like. So on many different scales, fungi are helping plants out. Okay, so we can demonstrate in the lab, we can see it out in nature. This is a really nice diagram that kind of shows that, that underground network. So the next time you're walking around outside and you're looking at the plants that are around, recognize that even if you can't see them, Fungi are probably helping them out in ways we don't even realize. Okay, so again, mycorrhizal fungi. Myco means fungus. Rhiza means root. So plant root fungi, 
have that symbiotic relationship with plants, they're really helpful. The other side of the coin is that sometimes fungi can be parasitic. So that means they um, can grow on a host and cause it harm. Some can even alter the behavior of the animals that it grows in. So this is a really unique fungus called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, or the zombie ant fungus. And so this is able to grow into the insect. It affects their nervous system. It makes them crawl away from their colony and up um, a leaf where it bites down and then the insect dies. But it's a really good vantage point for that fungus to grow up out and spread its spores the way it reproduces. So it doesn't just make the animal sick, it actually influences how it behaves. Um, so they're really helpful, but they can also be parasites um, some of them even infect humans. So if you've ever had athlete's foot or ringworm, these are both diseases caused by a fungus. Um, yeast infections are caused by fungi thrush, which is this infection on, um, in their mouth, is caused by a fungus. Um, and there's lots of other diseases that fungi can cause. Um, they're a little bit understudied compared to other diseases, so we're still coming up with good ways to treat these infections. So if you have um, ringworm or athlete's foot, there are good drugs that we can take called antifungals. They target the cell membrane specifically because that's, even though fungi and animals are so closely related, the stuff that makes up fungal cell walls is different enough from anything in human cells that we can use drugs against that and it won't affect us. Um, but like I said on the earlier slide, um, some, there are some antifungal drugs, but because we're not studying fungal diseases as much as things caused by bacteria or viruses, we don't have a whole lot available to treat a lot of these illnesses. Um, so if you're into, if you're going to go into the medical field, this is something to think about looking into. But they don't all cause harm. In fact, one fungus in particular is um, one we can thank for healing in the modern era. So if you've ever taken an antibiotic derived from penicillin, you can thank a fungus for that. Um, so certain things that we can derive from other species have been turned into drugs. And in the case of penicillin, which is a really good antibiotic, it's made by the penicillium fungi it's secreted as a way of combating bacteria. So a scientist accidentally grew it in their lab by leaving a bunch of petri dishes open, went for a vacation, came back. They looked in a plate that had bacteria in it, and they weren't growing anywhere near this unique fungus. So they were able to isolate those compounds in that petri dish, and that's why we have penicillin today. So very important fungus for humans. Another reason we have to thank fungi is for the things we eat. So some of my favorite things um, are made with fungi, with the help of fungi. So next time you dig into some pizza, you can thank fungi for the various components. So if the pizza dough is made with yeast, yeast is a unicellular fungus. Um, yeast are also what we use to ferment foods and uh, beverages. So kombucha is a fermented tea. Um, yeast and other and yeast and bacteria help ferment that kimchi. Um, you can thank fungi and bacteria, salami, cheese, um, sourdough bread, yeast, and other fungi contribute to those flavors and preserving those foods. So when we look at this pizza, not only is it the bread, but the cheese it's made out of. And if you top it with mushrooms, that's another example of a of a helpful fungus. Um, if you want to get really into the details, those mycorrhizal fungi probably help out with the tomatoes and some of the other herbs that are part of the sauce. Um, so even if it's not pizza, the next time you drink a soda, you can thank a fungus called aspergillus. So when you look on the ingredients list of some soda, a lot of them are made with citric acid, and that's made um, in mass quantities due to this aspergillus 
um, fungus growing in this petri dish right here. So some of them directly contribute to the foods we eat, like the rinds on cheeses um, and the, the yeast in our baked goods. Some of them are indirect by becoming little um, pharmacies manufacturing um, these important compounds that we use for food. Okay, so bread, beer, wine, all of those are thanks to, to fungi. Okay, so thinking about reproduction, we talked about that for all of the groups we've looked at. Um, fungi are really cool because they can reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, so the diagram down here is one example. Um, there are some fungi with very, very, very complicated life cycles with unique hosts in some points and different hosts in others. Um, but just knowing that they can reproduce by spores, um, asexually or sexually. So they can release spores that can then just grow into a new fungus. Sometimes they release spores that meet and fuse and form um, a genetically diverse population. Um, let's see. So these are some close-up pictures of spores. There are a couple of different ways that fungi have figured out how to spread them. So mushrooms, if you look underneath where the underneath the cap, there are usually some gills underneath, and that's where they're forming the spores that will then come out. So they're usually um, dispersed by the wind. Some like these earth stars here on the right, um, or puffball mushrooms have similar mechanisms where if a strong wind comes by or something touches it, maybe an animal walks by, they can make this huge plume of spores come out at once that can then be brought to a new place. So really sophisticated mechanisms for uh, moving their reproductive parts around. And then once these spores meet, or not, some of them can just grow into new organisms. Sometimes um, the spores will fuse Sometimes even the hyphae can fuse together. And the thing that directs whether or not these fungi can meet up and combine genetically um, are called mating types. Mating types are, are just genes that direct whether or not two individual spores can come together. Um, so usually these are expressed on the outside of their walls, so the two cells will meet and they'll either get the message that, hey, we can get together, yay, and they can fuse, or they're incompatible and they, they won't grow together. They're antagonistic. Um, so this really cool fungus right here, here are those gills that I was talking about. These are where those spores come from. These have a really complicated um, mating type system. So they have more than 28,000 different ways of combining their different mating types. So if you think your relationships are complicated, think about the poor schizophilum commune fungus. So that was fungal reproduction. That was fungi as a whole. Again, really important for the environment in lots of different capacities um, and organisms we can think for a lot of um, the things that bring us joy. So now moving on to animals. The group we're probably all more familiar with Again, all of these are heterotrophs. All animals are multicellular, so fungi could go from unicellular to multicellular. All animals have multiple cells. And at some point in the life cycle, there's exceptions, but for the most part, all animals move under their own power at some point in their life cycle. Okay, we range from these cute fluffy mammals right here to things like jellyfish and sponges, all kinds of different environments. Okay, so thinking about evolutionary relationships between animals, we mentioned the Cambrian explosion a couple lectures ago, but that's where we really see the, the burst of lineages that leads to the diversity we know today. Again, this is from your textbook. This just kind of breaks down the, the big groups of organisms. Um, so multicellularity is something we all have in common. Um, and you can see some of the other traits that separate different groups of animals. 
And here we are, humans are part of the, the group chordata since we have spinal cords. Um, scientists are still kind of debating what the relationships are here. The farther back in time you go, the harder it is to suss out who's related to who. So this might change. Again, trees are hypotheses. Okay, so we'll dig into some more details about animals. Um, so right now, the, the main hypothesis is that sponges are the group that's most, that's equally related to the rest of the animals. Um, but there are some groups, some researchers that posit that things like jellyfish or cnidarians are actually the thing that's related to the rest of the animals. Um, so part of those things that separate those groups um, they don't have specific tissues necessarily. So neither of those organisms have nervous systems like ours um, or digestive systems like ours. Um, and then different degrees of motility. So both cnidarians, which are jellyfish and their relatives, and sponges um, are stationary for a lot of the time. So something that, that separates them from, from the rest of the group. OK, so we're all multicellular. What are all those cells doing? Well, they're aggregating into a specialized group called tissues. Um, so our bones, our blood, skin, uh, muscles, nervous tissue, those are all specific groups of different types of cells. So one of the um, most complex groups of tissues is our nervous system. So this is what signals the rest of the body. This is this really amazing combination of chemical, electrical signatures um, that gives rise to how we experience our environment. So vision, hearing, taste, smell, touch, proprioception, all of those um, senses are driven by, interpreted by our nervous system. And thinking about our metabolism, again, we're all heterotrophs, just like fungi. We're getting other things for food. Um, we've internalized our digestive system. So instead of secreting um, extracellular, and uh, instead of secreting enzymes that break things down, uh, we have internal organs that help do that for us. Uh, and again, that's in general. Some animals do it differently. Um, so in ours, we have all of these sophisticated pieces that help break down our food. Um, ruminants, so things like sheep, cows, um, can have multiple chambers to their stomachs. Um, and they're able to eat different foods than we are. And a lot of that is due to, you guessed it, bacteria and fungi to help them break down those, those hard plant tissues. We have um, specific fungi and bacteria in our guts as well that, that do that for us. OK, so those were different examples of, of tissues and how that related to our metabolism. And now thinking about animal contributions to ecology. So we saw this image when we were talking about plants. Um, on the, the other side of it, animals help move um, pollen from different plants to another. We're also good at recycling nutrients. Um, so things that break down um, different animals and plants, et cetera, lots of contributions. And so along with these ideas about ecology, we can break animals down into a few different groups. So we have detritivores, herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, and parasites. So vor just means food or eating. So in general, we can kind of break down animals into these different ecological categories. Detritivores feed on dead and decomposing organic matter. So detrite comes from detritus, or just like decomposing things. So we can thank millipedes um, and things like fiddler crabs for breaking down dead things. That's what contributes to the recycling. Um, so that's a really big contribution that these animals have. I just think millipedes are so cute. Okay, so detritivores break down decomposing matter. 
Um, it's good for making compost, good for recycling nutrients. Herbivores are things that eat plants and algae. So herbs, plants, things that eat plants. Um, rabbits, elephants, koalas, um, all uh, dependent on plants for their food energy. And more often than, than not, they're not killing the whole organism. So these can contribute to the environment by um, pruning plants back, um, spreading seeds, etc. That brings us to carnivores. So things that feed on other animals. So everything from this anteater, right, it's all in its name, um, to this lioness over here, you can even put them together, and the larvae of these insects called ant lions are really good predators and carnivores. They make these little burrows, and then they like jump out and grab their prey. So everything from ant eaters, lions, to ant lions are all carnivores. And then our second to last category is omnivores. So omni means all omnivores can eat lots and lots of different things. So a combination of plants, animals, fungi, all of the other things that are out there. So raccoons are very, very good omnivores. Humans are good omnivores. So we may choose to eat different things, but we're capable of um, gaining energy from lots of different sources of food. And then the last category, which is one of the most interesting, is parasites. So some people lump parasites in with carnivores. Um, but I think they kind of deserve to have their own little section. So parasites make up 40% of animal species. They're organisms that feed on another organism at some point in their life cycle. So there are parasitic wasps that can um, immobilize things like insects and lay their eggs in them. And then those wasp larvae grow up and eat the carcass of that, of that animal that the wasp predates. Um, there are lots of really amazing examples of cool parasites. Um, when we look across the tree, the evolutionary tree of animals, scientists have estimated that animals have made that transition to parasitism more than 200 times. So seemingly a very good strategy if you want to survive. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of parasitism. If we look in the mouth of this fish, it's not its tongue, it's this little isopod called Thiamosa exigua. And so this little um, isopod, crustacean-like animal, kind of bites onto this fish's tongue, and somehow that tongue falls out. The isopod basically replaces that fish's tongue and acts like a tongue and just hangs out and eats some of its food. So a really strange animal. And if you want to learn more, you can read this. Um, wonderful book about all kinds of different parasites called Parasite Rex. Okay. So those are the different zoological categories. Again, that doesn't encompass all animals necessarily, but those are some broad categories we can fit them into. Um, animals, at least in comparison to human animals, have some medical importance for us. Um, so some medications have been derived from different animals, especially things like anti-venom. So Gila monsters are, are venomous desert-dwelling animal. Pictured right here, um, its venom has been used to help treat type 2 diabetes uh, by regulating those glucose levels. Um, so a really interesting application. Um, snake anti-venoms have been developed that can help treat snake bites. Um, so lots of medical importance. And thinking about reproduction, so we've talked about reproduction when we've talked about meiosis, um, but animals um, most often reproduce sexually. Um, and that's important because sexual reproduction increases genetic variation. So most animals don't have that ability to reproduce asexually. Some do. Um, but for the most part, they are reproducing by combining gametes. And that looks um, different depending on what groups of organisms are doing it. So things like humans have internal fertilization. So basically, 
the gametes from one organism are going inside that of another, and that's where they meet. Um, so dragonflies, birds like penguins, humans, um, exchange gametes internally, so internal fertilization. And this is compared to things that use external fertilization. So fish, frogs, a lot of aquatic organisms um, have this kind of strategy where females will lay eggs, males will um, secrete sperm, and all of that happens on the outside of the animal's body. Um, so you can kind of think about what that means in terms of the care that animals give, so more often than not things with external fertilization don't invest a whole lot of um, care in maintaining the young, but there's always exceptions. If you have something going on inside an animal's body that limits how many offspring you can have, um, so, so different ways of reproducing can lead to all this different variation. And that's all I have to say about animals and fungi. So again, these were just very, very small snapshots about the diversity that exists. Um, this was the last of three lectures that talked about the tree of life. I really hope that through these lectures, um, the labs you've done, and your projects, you've kind of started to realize how amazing and how precious um, these species are. So if you are in a situation where you're looking for things to do once the semester ends and you're, you're craving that uh, school-like environment and you want to learn more, um, the Planet Earth series is really excellent. Um, lots of PBS documentaries about nature um, and other things do a really good job of going over different groups of animals and plants and fungi and all of those things. Um, so next week we've got one more lecture. Uh, that will wrap up the semester. We're going to look at life, Earth, on a, on a global scale. So we'll talk about things like biomes and the environment. Um, so we've gone all the way from atoms at the beginning of the semester to the Earth as a whole. Um, I'm really proud of you guys for uh, going through this transition um, and still doing your best work. So thank you guys so much. Um, keep it up. Almost there. That wraps up diversification. Lecture quiz at the end of the biology presentations next week. No more lab activities. Um, so that's it. It was so nice to see you guys, see your faces and your presentations. I'm looking forward to seeing those again. Check Moodle for your specific feedback um, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much.